if you will. We're looking at Gibson ES line. So it all started in 1958 with the ES-335. Now the ES-335 is essentially a solid block in the center and two wings on the side. So it's really not all that far off from Les Paul's original log that he pitched, uh, pitched to Gibson in the late 40s essentially, which was a, a log in the center with wings on the side. Um, this guitar was did pretty well right out of the chute. Very practical guitar, has a lot of voices in it, and it was embraced not just by professionals, but a lot of studio guys. For instance, um, Larry Carlton, he went to a whole lot of sessions and only used his 335. That's why he is Mr. 335, because it's got and, and if you listen to those, I don't know, like a Celia Dan stuff. You know. humbuckers. Uh, originally they had PAFs. These are actually some DiMarzio uh, PAFs that I have in this guitar. Uh, but they're very versatile and kind of great for everything. A lot of people don't realize how common they are. For instance, uh, everybody thinks of Cliffs of Dover as a, as a Strat thing, but he recorded most of it, Eric Johnson recorded most of it on a 335. My apologies, I wasn't even close, but you get the idea. Um, originally, I think, I think all that, uh, the main body of the song, I think that was all the 335. So I don't know where he used the strap, but I think that was the, the most of it. Um, also, there's, you know, Clapton, of course, in, um, had that 64 red 335 with cream at Royal Albert Hall. And that, I mean, that kind of solidified it as a rock and roll guitar. <laughs> Very versatile. So it started with this. This was this was the the one that came in the shoot, um, and they were uh, I believe dot necks, um, and embraced as I said by studio guys. If you look at the uh, Tom Bukovac rig rundown, big studio guy in Nashville right now, and he is his he probably does the majority of his playing on a three thirty five. Now next, they're top of the line. They had the three thirty five. They had the 345, which was a little bit fancier. Some of them had a very tone, some of them didn't. They had a, some of them had a, I think a, uh, a three-piece maple neck. Uh, but their top of their line was the ES355, uh, which this is. And this is a 19, um, 1961. So this guitar, same, you know, basic shape as the 335, same basic details, but as an ebony fingerboard, it has this split diamond, much like a Les Paul Custom. Fancier tuners, this is Grover's, but they also came with Imperials. 
but and most of them came with either a Bigsby or a Vibrola, uh, Vibrola. But the chief difference is this guy right here, the Varietone. Um, so the first position is not engaged, and you'll hear just these straight PFs. <laughs> So, for the record, um, I'm running into a Fender Blues Junior that's right over there. You can kind of see it. And I've got this little modest pedal board right now, which has a couple overdrives and a delay and an old Ross compressor. But right now, all you're hearing is just the guitar straight in. But as you work on this, this uh, varietone, the first setting makes it kind of funky and single coiling. It's just like such a... Last setting. God, that is just so weird, right? Put a little dirt with that. It's not as pronounced, but a very cool, weird tone. B.B. King, of course, is Lucille, is based on this, although they did a model uh, uh, Lucille with, without, the, um, without the F holes. Uh, a lot of vintage guys um, will have the, the Varietone removed because they, they maintain it changes the color of the pickups, but Gibson says it doesn't, and I believe him, I can't tell. And even if it doesn't, this thing sounds great, so I don't care. It's, I like it just how they made it. However, you can see up here, it says stereo. So originally, when I got this guitar, uh, there was a cable that came out of here that split the signal, and this pickup would go to one side, and this pickup would go to the other. Not really stereo, I don't know what, what the practical application was for that, but if you plugged a standard cable into it, you would only get one pickup unless you moved it out and then you could get the other one. So it was kind of ridiculous. Um, but again, that's part of history. You gotta hand it to Gibson for trying new things. So why don't we go further down the three, or the, uh, the ES rabbit hole and take a look at, take a look at this weirdo. So in 1969, they came out with the uh, ES 150DC. Now the the uh, ES 150 was the first Gibson's first electric guitar, I think, and it's based basically on a on an L50, but it had a uh, pickup in it. So it's the first you know electric Spanish ES. Um, then in '69 they came out with this, and as you can see, it's kind of I mean compare it right there. The front is basically the same, although the, the 150 has the master volume right there. Uh, originally, this one had a trapeze just like this. I think this is 72. And, but the chief difference is that this 150 is like way fatter. That's the first thing you notice. And then when you pick it up, you realize it's really light because it's entirely hollow. 
Uh, it's it, no wooden block, it, no uh, maple block in the middle, like the 335, 345, 350. Now, the 330, not to go too nerdy, that was a true hollow body as well. It had single coil pickups. The rest of them all had uh, humbuckers because in 1958, that was the standard. They had been in 57 and put them in everything, except for the 330, uh, which is like the Epiphone Casino. Anyway, it's all related. This is the way this thing sounds, kind of a, kind of a cool jazzy tone, you know. actual 69 this is the first year they made them and it's this guitar I can't believe how clean it is whoever owned it before me just never played it and you can see in 69 there's no volute they added the volute in the 70s anyway I don't want to get into minutia but this is uh, this is the 150 oh let me you know what let me put on the bridge a little bit and hear that as well Got a little dirt to it see that true hollow body gets can get away from you okay so that's the 150 now the last in our weirdo uh, ES model this is the 336 it came out in the early 2000s in the custom shop uh, and it's like the others only it's Quite a bit smaller as you can see and the most interesting difference to me is that whereas the other ones the 335 uh, etc those are all basically plywood it's a maple ply and it's got to be because to get this this arch top and arch back you do have to you, you have, have to have malleable wood and solid solid chuck is going to do that so what they did in the custom shop in the early 2000s is it came out with a smaller 335 with a solid chunk of mahogany body that's, and a solid maple top and they hollowed out, they carved, they carved it uh, so it's got this arch to it and then hollowed it out on the sides and left a solid maple, a uh, 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 solid chunk in the center and then carved out a maple top. So as far as like craftsmanship, luthier work, this is really an impressive instrument. They're kind of a sleeper. Um, I don't think they really caught on, but how they are really great sound. This is, and it came with burst bucker pickups. Uh, I added a Stets bar, but it had a stop tail piece originally. But this is what this one sounds like. Thank you. 
it's a really nice guitar. Um, I, I don't know, I play with this one quite a bit because it's got that whole 335 vibe to it, but to me it's also got kind of a, a little more solid body nature to it. <laughs> Very singy. So those are the basics, just looking at a little compare and contrast of 335s. Uh, well, the, the ES family, three, 335, 355, three, uh, 336, and a 150. So uh, while you're online like you are right now, go ahead and subscribe to our Facebook page, our YouTube channel, to Instagram, to all that social media stuff. Uh, and why not have a hard copy of the magazine sent right to your home? I know I do. This is John Bolger. Till next time, play on, amigos.